Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the moderator, R.J. King, editor of Our and D Business. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, thank you uh, for coming today. Uh, let's just get right into it. Um, Jay, what was it like working for Elon? Uh, good question. It was intense. And it was uh, it was great, great experience. It was not easy to work for Elon, but for me, um, he was a phenomenal inspiration. Um, he's one of the most innovative leaders. Um, I would say the smartest person I've ever worked with. Um, I worked for many other companies, Oracle, VMware, but Elon was super, super smart. But at the same time, there is a he's also um, extremely well-rounded. I would say um, he. He can be extremely nerdy. He can talk about space, rockets, and code. At the same time, he can quickly switch and talk about business, finance, uh, top line, bottom line, margins, and what do you do. Um, so, I mean, he's one of one of the I'd say visionary and innovative leaders, and I had the opportunity to uh, work with. And he sets. Impossible targets. So any target he tells his people, including his executives, um, the first time when he says that, it would be impossible. So you're going to tell that a project is going to take, like, okay, this many years to achieve. Um, on the scale of, you'd say, if it is four years, you'd say, okay, well, why can't you do it in like four days or four weeks? So that's the level of scale he would look at. Um, I, I, I don't think he does it um, in a way to be rude or insult people, but that's exactly how he sets target for himself as well. So he measures himself in a way that people have to do things. There is, the life is too short. There's so much to do for this world. That's exactly how he thinks. So let's get going. Let's get doing. And another important thing I learned from is he mentioned this in public interviews. He goes to the fundamentals of everything. So he'll always cut to the bottommost most fundamental way and approach it from ground up. He will not take it incremental. So if there are cases where people will prepare for weeks um, for Elon's presentation, and they will go and present, this is exactly what they'll be, they'll be doing. And obviously, they're, they're smart people. They would have spent a lot more time to say, this is how they're going to approach it. Here is a solution for this big problem. Many times he would absolutely turn that upside down and give a pointer which will go back to the basics. And people will think, why didn't I think about this? Um, I, can, I can give an example. Um, there was an optimization for a robot manufacturing um, cells, um, right? So for the battery cells. So it takes, um, there is several thousand cells in a battery pack in a, Tesla lithium ion battery pack in a Tesla automobile, right? So there are robots which will have uh, pick cells quickly and then assemble. It's a standard machinery um, bought from a very, very standard uh, kind of robotics manufacturer. And it will keep doing that um, very quickly. And they were trying to optimize to increase the production rate. So it will pick cells and then put it in an assembly, which will create smaller packs, which will go into a bigger pack. And then um, the team worked really hard to optimize it. So they kept optimizing, optimizing, optimizing. And then they said, OK, they came back and said, wow, we optimized it to kind of 200% uh, from where we are. Our production capacity is going to be doubled. And then Elon looked at it and said, like, OK, we, um, how are you doing it? And he said, no, no, we tuned the machine. It picks in a much faster rate to go from here to here. And then it picks the batteries um, like this. And then he say, he, his question is, like, OK, there's a robot. Like, how, how many cells does it pick at a time? And he said, like, OK, it picks one cell, but you know, multiple robots operating. And then it just uh, picks very, very quickly, and we tuned it. And he just uh, for a second he thought about it and he said, no, it's not still good enough. He said, if it picks one cell, why can't it pick 10 cells at a time instead of one cell? And people were like, uh, there's no machine like that. He said, OK, why don't you talk to the manufacturer to go make a machine like that? So that's exactly how we think. And they made it. They went, spoke to the manufacturer, and said, instead of picking one cell at a time, the robot started picking 10 cells at a time, because beyond that, it's kind of uh, reducing scale. So that really improved the production capability 
instead of uh, 200 percent, it increased it by like 1,000 percent. So that's how he thinks, and it was a phenomenal opportunity and learning experience for me to work with him. Great. Uh, well, we've talked about autonomous vehicles today and uh, also connected vehicles. Uh, but say I have a uh, 1962 Lincoln Continental. How does that get integrated into this autonomous uh, driving market? Uh, will we have kits that we can buy for our cars with sensors that we attach inside? Yeah. Or how is that going to be done? I think, yes, a good, a great, great question. Um, there are a lot of companies that have been doing, which also, again, as I said, very encouraging. Um, I've spoken to many company, companies have approached me as well for different things, like for knowledge and being an advisor and things like that. Yes, there are kits available to retrofit cars. Um, I wouldn't personally advise uh, doing it yet <laughs> um, for those because the ideal situation is to um, the cars itself, the wholly integrated system. If you're really savvy about automobiles and if you're adventurous, absolutely, yes, um, go for it. But for a normal um, user who just want to get from point A to point B, I wouldn't recommend going and um, retrofitting these uh, solutions. There are known ones, good ones. There are very new ones, but could be advanced ones. But I, would gen I wouldn't generally recommend going. Uh, but wait for the next version of the Lincoln that comes with those sensors would be my advice. OK, great. Um, and last one, and before we get to the audience, uh, back to Elon a little bit. I mean, even he has talked about concerns of the rollout of artificial intelligence. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we've all seen the Terminator movies and, and the Matrix. You know, a machine uh, could one day override that kill switch. I mean, what are your thoughts and, you know, from what you've learned yeah. from Elon and yourself about, about artificial intelligence? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the potential is there, and as I said, if we don't do the right thing. I think with the bright minds we have, I, I, I'm not worried about a machine overriding the kill switch. The reason is, if we don't put in this, if everyone is saying everything is hunky-dory, it's only the, the best things we look at and we are not um, aware of the risk, then yes, that potential is there. But with people like Elon and Bill Gates, and there are many other people who are already talking, they said they're personally worried about um, the risk, and Google already taking steps. I, I am not really worried about the reason is if you think about early days, people were worried about um, internet. Um, people were worried about cloud. Yes, the security problem has increased, but it's like, I, I think I will go back to this analogy of our home and neighborhood. I know it's not exactly the comparison, but very similar, right? Because we don't run away from our home or, or completely disband our neighborhood just because there are some robberies or some thefts or some events happening because we just take steps to protect it. And that's exactly what should happen with this. The right minds, the right people have to collaborate, create some platforms, um, create security measures, create standards in collaboration with government and ensure that all of those are enforced and implemented. That is what is very, very important. It's encouraging to see the amount of uh, uh, brain power investment and the right people involving in Stephen Hawking's, um, I think, uh, involving in taking measures to implement um, security um, measures to it as well as standards. Uh, so I'm not, I'm worried but not super worried about it because I think um, all the right steps are happening. A lot more real practical implementation needs to happen but the right, we are going in the right direction. Okay, great. Um, let's get uh, going with the uh, questions from the audience. Uh, do we have a microphone? Uh, looks like we have a lot of okay. questions on the... Thank you. Uh, sure. Maybe say your name and who you're with and then uh, ask the question. Hi, I am Dr. Reddy. This is for uh, future generations and interpersonal relations. During my generation, when the kids come home, they used to talk to us. Mm -hmm. As soon as they come now, they are talking to their yeah. iPhones and laptops. Yeah. The human relations are degrading, is my feeling. What is all these developments that will have a future effect on human generations to come? Uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a great question. This is a question I personally also think about all the time. I think many of us do. 
I think it's the kids as well as it's us as well to most part. Um, I don't know, I can talk about myself where we look at the phone most of the time, work related um, all the time, right? We engage, text, and do. Um, in, in, this is purely my personal view. Um, it's not going to change totally, but these are cycles which will go one, one big round. I'm thinking it will go to the kind of the extreme and then come back to that human connection and human relation to it. Um, again, in terms of change, the way I look at, um, this is something, I, I, again, philosophical, but I'll share with you anyway. I know for humans in general, um, we feel that we are, we are comfortable not changing. We are comfortable with things being constant. On the contrary, in reality, if you see things around us change or we change um, all the time. Um, the simple thing to show that is every day, you know, our, the, the cells in our body changes. Um, you see plants, trees, they grow. Every day their cell structure change. Um, I know it's very micro, but you know, it's a good thing to recognize to give that paradigm shift. Whether we like it or not, change happens in us and around us. So the moment we embrace the change, then things start, you start looking at things in a very different way and in fact much more positive to say what should I do to be part of this change and make it much more positive. On coming back to companies, enterprise, um, I think Sirius talk, talked about Kodak. So Kodak missed disrupting itself. They were too comfortable in saying, in fact, I don't know if people know, they were the first inventors of, or one of the first inventors of digital camera. They really invented it. But they didn't take steps because they thought things are not going to change. They thought like, okay, we are making money, we are doing well in our business, why should we even go spend this effort and time to go change? So the moral of the story is, if you don't disrupt or try disrupting yourself, someone else will do it. And Netflix is another good example of how someone did it, like you, see, you know, Blockbuster, I mean, I loved that store going and browsing, many of us did, like DVDs and VHS tapes. They don't exist anymore. Because when Netflix started DVD and then streaming came about, but Netflix was the first one to disturb themselves. They said like, okay, they didn't sit there and said, oh, my DVD business is doing great. We are just shipping DVDs and things are doing well. They said, no, no, we are moving forward, disrupting ourselves and doing streaming so that someone else doesn't come and do it. So I think it's an important, I, I know it's a little roundabout. The, the thing is change will happen whether we like it or not. It's up to us to kind of make some po positive spin about it and say how do we bring about the human interaction as part of that change itself. I know it's kind of a very vague, big answer, but that's what I could say from my view. Uh, thanks, Jay. We're over here. Yeah. I think uh, there are a few questions here. Uh, whichever order we want to go, we can. Which Stephen. Uh, Entered one of those questions. Oh, okay. Stephen? It was actually addressed to Cyrus at the last one, but you would started to answer it. Um, sure. It was regarding the Terminator matrix outcome with, as a result of the machine learning. And it seems like an obvious outcome would be that at some point the machine would figure out that human nature is the root cause of a lot of the problems. And it seems like an obvious outcome that the, it would figure out that we're the cancer and you got to get rid of it. And as interconnected with, as we are and as dependent upon technology as we've become, how long would it take for a machine to figure out that if it wipes out the electrical grid and all the supply chains stop, that 90 some odd percent of the people would perish within a relatively short amount of time? How would, how would we figure out, is that the question? Sorry, I didn't uh, get the last line. We're dependent on electricity for our very lives. Yeah. And machines are heavily involved in that. Yes. So the machines figure out that humans are the problem. The machines decide to take down the grid and keep it down. 90% plus of us die. We go back to the Stone Age. That seems like a pretty obvious outcome of where this is all headed. Thank you. Well, um, I think it's a very smart question. Um, I, I, I personally feel, yes, there is a risk, but since we are aware of the risk, I think we should do, which we think 
things have started in that direction. Because we are teaching machine, right? End of the day, who does? It's our programmers. We really code on how a machine should learn. I know after the fact it might be too late. Um, it's better to have those um, coding safety and security standards, like you said. There are things, kill switch is probably for one for all, but again, there are a lot more things we could do as a safety measure. This is where the guidelines is important. So for example, we could always say, the machine should never learn anything about safety or the, the power grids. There are potential ways we could secure it. It's end of the day, the implementation. Um, so I think there has to be rigor to implement it so that now that we are aware of the risk, of the potential risk and how big it could be, actions has to be taken. Implementations has to happen. Only then I think we can avoid that risk. The, as I said, good news is I'm confident the bright minds are already talking about it. That means you, and it's not about just the minds, they have the resources to put in, which is important. It's not about someone in the government just talking about it or someone um, somewhere who doesn't have the right resources talking about it. I think we are, we are talking about Bill Gates, the richest person in the planet, and then Elon Musk. They have the right resources. They can bring in the right brain power to put the security measures. So at this point, as I said, I'm, even though I'm worried, I'm not super worried about it because I think the right actions will be in place. That's just my view. Uh, Jay, over here on your left, uh, with the last question. Uh, my name is Maytham. So basically, when I'm driving and I see a pedestrian trying to cross the street or a distracted driver, I can, you know, predict that and slow down or change lanes. How does an autonomous vehicle factor in human sentiment? Very good question. I think that's something. This is. I think this is a key discussion in uh, in in the government kind of the safety and guidelines and ethics, right? So who writes the rules to the machines? Like you said, the machines will take decisions, but who, who really does the rules? I think I understand your question, say, if you see a human, and if you see um, a post, if you avoid the human, you have to hit the post, and if the vehicle has like four people in it, do you hit the human to risk one life, or do you hit the post to hit four lives? Who makes that decision, right? Only one, one thing I could say is, I mean, I don't know the answer. I think it's a very complex one when it's involved sensitivity. But the most important thing is I would say the machines can take decisions much faster in a fraction of a second than a human can react and apply it. That is the biggest advantage you have. The machine has a chance of avoiding both, but the humans may not have. With that, I'll leave it. Okay? Thanks. All right, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Jay, and uh, the next session will be coming up very quickly. Jay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Jay Vijayan and R.J. King.